Makrita, can you put the opening slide up? Yes. We are now broadcasting to all attendees. Nice. Hello, all attendees. <laughs> and here we have our slide. Hopefully everyone knows where they are. But if not, we are here on our discussion about trust, open source and Baltimore from 12 p.m. But we're gonna wait a few minutes just to let everyone join before we kick off the discussion. I'll just give them one minute. We need Jeopardy music. We do, we, uh, that's exactly what's missing from many of these events is a theme tune. We, yep. we should all we should all figure out what a great theme tune would have been for this for this session. Aaron, <laughs> well, Aaron when are we music music great is, too? I'm gonna do that next time. Yeah, yeah. That that should have been one of our panelists' questions. If you had to choose a theme tune for this question for this session, what would it have been? <laughs> mm, and I love music. Yeah, yeah. Something to believe. What song should we choose? I don't know. That's uh, that's a, that's that's a good question. Something about believe trust openness i'm getting imagine. i'm getting lost imagine imagine that's brilliant <laughs> yeah you know i got in trouble for teaching imagine in morocco when i was a teacher there imagine there's no heaven oh yeah oh you gotta be really yeah. careful you gotta be really careful. maybe an instrumental would probably be our better bet <laughs> something upbeat you know <laughs> okay well i guess um i guess we are going to probably just get started now. I wonder if Seema, you can, you can, oh, we have our poll results to get started. So first of all, I would just like to welcome everyone who's come along today to our discussion session on open source trust and Baltimore. Um, we're here today to talk about, I suppose, the challenges of building software that's really trustworthy and valuable to communities. But the role that Baltimore is playing in showing, in, in becoming a global center for how community participation can help build really great city services that are both trustworthy and valuable. So before we get kicked off and introduce our panelists, we are going to share some poll results um, just to have an idea about who is with us here today. And the majority, just over half our attendees say, oh no, they're gone. Thank you very much. <laughs> our, um, live and work in Baltimore. Uh, but lots of folks are from outside uh, Baltimore as well. We've got a good representation from there. And we have a lot of folks from community-based or nonprofits. Um, and a great, a great uh, mix of people from various different places. So um, it's fantastic to have you all here today. We are going to get started by introducing our panelists here, and um, then we will go straight into having our discussion. So today we have, and first of all, I'll just go around very quickly and introduce our panelists. If um, if everyone can wave when, when I introduce you, that would be great. Um, perhaps, folks, if you want to take away the, the slide so we can see um, all our panelists, that would be amazing. If we can just uh, stop sharing the screen there, that would be great. Fantastic. Now we get more, more headroom for everyone, <laughs> or body room if you need it. Um, but uh, but let's, let's get started. So today we have um, Dion Joyner-Weems, who is the chair of Hack Baltimore, uh, which is a citywide civic tech movement working to design sustainable solutions to support Baltimore's communities. And I know you guys, a lot of you may know a lot of these organizations already, but there are some people from outside Baltimore. So forgive me if I, if I dwell on, on the Baltimore uh, organizations as well. Go so ahead. Denise Cooper, is a longtime open source advocate, a former CTO of Wikimedia, former senior director of open source at Intel, and who led Sun's efforts to open source uh, open office. So this is a so long-term open source advocate here from Denise. Um, we are joined by Jane Chartrand as a human-centered designer who's working in St. Francis Neighborhood Center, 
which has existed since 1963 to raise awareness and bring change to the, young, the lives of young people in the communities of Reservoir Hill and Penn North here in Baltimore City. Um, and I know that, Jane, you have been involved in some of the efforts to have open source help the work that's happening at St. Francis. And we should be joined shortly by um, another uh, brilliant gent from St. Francis, uh, Torben Green, who's not here right now, but should be joining us uh, shortly. So we'll, we'll welcome Torben when he arrives. We've got Saeed Chowdhury, who's um, got a number of roles at Johns Hopkins University. So uh, among, which count among, being the Associate Dean for Research Data Management, but also the Hodson Director of Digital Research and Curation Center. But I know you've also been involved in the setup and running of Johns Hopkins uh, Open Source Program Office, which we think is one of the first university uh, open source program offices in the world, which is amazing. And Jacob Green, uh, who is the founder of MossLabs.io, another native of Baltimore, um, who has been working to expand the impact of open source in society globally. And I know in the last few years, Jacob, you've been working on global projects and bringing together the folks in places like the city of Paris, with people in John Hopkins and in the city of Baltimore and institutions and helping make all that work. So, um, so welcome to you all. My name is Claire Dillon. I work with Moss Labs in Ireland and I work on helping um, accelerate the impact of open source in Ireland and, and in Europe. So we're delighted to be here today. And without further ado, we'll um, maybe hear from some of our panelists, some of their points of view. So we had a brief discussion before this to get kicked off. And um, I think it would be wonderful to hear maybe from Dion, you had a great point of view in terms of the importance of trust in technology. And I think that will help frame this whole conversation. So maybe you can share your experiences about trust or what the lack of it can do. Okay, promise me that you'll keep me on time because you know how I can get. Like, I'll be like, first, first, I have got to thank Dr. Seema Iyer. She does not, she doesn't like me saying this, but in Baltimore, I have branded her the Beyonce of data. Um, oh, oh, <laughs> I mean, really. Beyonce June, we should have had a Beyonce <laughs> June. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um, I, I really do appreciate everything that the Baltimore Neighborhood of Indicators Alliance has, is doing um, in this city. I, again, my name is Dion Joyner Williams. It's like a tribe called Quest. You got to say it all together. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Audacity Group, which is a brand shop for bold ideas. And I'm proud to chair Hack Baltimore alongside a brother I never wanted, um, Dalali Jarasa, who is the president and CEO of Fearless and quite a visionary in his own right. Um, here's the deal. I am born and raised um, Sandtown, Winchester, okay? And I've marketed the city of Baltimore for over 13 years. What I love about Hack Baltimore is that it's built on two principles, right? The first one is that problems can be solved, right? The second is that the people in Baltimore have the power to solve them. Very simple. Two things. So our key focus is really on um, what you need in order to have a healthy destination, right? Housing, education, health and wellness, public safety, transportation, workforce development. Um, Hack Baltimore is really challenging people to approach problems by intentionally changing the seats around the table. Like, it's been an eye-opening experience for me to be in these spaces, and I have to ask the question, how can an organization or a government expect trust to create sustainable solutions if they're not engaged and they have not involved the people that are most impacted by the problem. Um, so Hack Baltimore is really that convener of um, the communities that are facing the challenge, right? The city agencies that are tasked with addressing the challenges and the community of technologists and city advocates and nonprofits and dot, dot, dot all over Baltimore who are willing to do the work. Actually, let me stop who have been doing the work. When we talk about COVID-19, um, what it really did was um, unveil the inequities that we always knew had long existed, not just in, in Baltimore, but in major urban cities across the United States, right? Um, so why put a Band-Aid on a problem when we could really use this opportunity to reimagine how we approach you know, um, how we approach life. Really. So I'll say this, because I know that I can talk a lot. No, there, thank you. <laughs> um, there is a coded inequity, right? Um, 
in order for there to be this technology innovation, social innovation, people have got to give a shit. And I, I, excuse my French, but it's serious. You have to care. You have to have an understanding of the prejudice that fosters the skepticism that black and brown people in communities rightfully have of technology, right? But we have an opportunity to show that tech is just a, um, what's it like a, a, a catalyst. It really is about the designer. Like we really do create things in the image of the designer. So representation matters. We need to make sure that we have the community sitting at the table, not so that we can create something for them, create something with them, right? So this concept, it may sound like, oh, you know, that's, that's easy. No, it's, mm -hmm. it's not. Like tech, people feel as though it's neutral, but it's not. Um, it really does matter how you're how you're thinking around the table. So I'll stop talking, but just want to say thank you again for for being here and a shout out to like all of our partners did education, accelerate Baltimore, code in Baltimore, code in the schools, dot dot dot. This is a collaboration. It's not just about one person if we're going to get this done right. So I think they're incredibly important points and the idea that community has to be at the heart and, and the base of everything that's done is such an important one in terms of um, in terms of how we make the world a better place. Right. Technology shouldn't be done to people. It needs to be done with, with yeah, people. If right, we're digitally right. transforming, we don't force it on. But Denise, you've been in that open source world for so long. And I know community is such an important concept in the open source world. But But can you talk specifically maybe about open source and and kind of how it can help create trust in whatever software is being built um whether it be community-based or even in the context of of some uh you know software that might be becoming from corporations but just to think about how open source impacts trust oh we can't hear you you're on mute thank you so um, the open source movement started because a group of technologists didn't trust the big companies that were producing the software that we were required to use every day. Um, we could see there were defects in that software, but because it was shipped as an executable, we couldn't fix them. We had to wait for the company to get around to fixing them. And in the case of some of those companies, it took, you know, they took their sweet time to fix things that were really annoying to us. So we started a movement to create software that would always be available in source form so that people who knew how to fix problems could get after that as quickly as they needed to. And it turned out to be you know, the first really big leveraging of the web to build stuff um, around the world that teams that build open source software are in every country and they you know it, they're working asynchronously they don't check into a nine to five they don't try to get on the same con call very often um, and coming up with those ways of people working asynchronously was a really big advantage but you know i just am now um coming to well another stage of a project i've been working on since the beginning of the pandemic um, in Ireland, we decided to roll our own COVID tracing app. And um, the company that I work for in, yeah, in Waterford uh, did the tech on that, did, you know, did the actual coding. And I got involved in some of the policy work. Um, and then we got an opportunity just last week to give the app away to the Linux Foundation. So the, the health authorities in Ireland were interested in helping do that because it's the first time that Ireland has produced something first that the rest of the world could feasibly use. And because we have privacy advocates in this country who were very concerned about the implications of people's information being you know, tracked, right? The whole implication of tracing is, is um, nervous, nerve wracking for people who are into privacy because well, what are they going to do with that data and who's going to see it and all those questions, right? So we went to a lot of trouble to design this from a privacy perspective, privacy first. So the data set that we collect is super small. It's the minimum viable uh, amount of data that it can be. And in fact, we don't ever know who you are unless you choose to tell us. Everything is at the discretion of the person who owns the phone, including whether or not they share the data that we've collected with the health authorities. They can decide that 
at the moment that they're asked to do it. It's not automatic because you happen to have the app on your phone. And um, we allowed our privacy advocates to look at our code and inspect it. And then we published the code publicly so that even a broader group of people could inspect it. And the upshot of it is that those privacy advocates actually encouraged people to put it, to use the app. We're at almost half of the population of Ireland now has put this app on their phone in just two weeks. And I think that that's the deepest penetration of any app anywhere in the world at this point. So we, what we see and what Ireland is learning, because Ireland's not known for their open source chops, right? Um, I'm interested in seeing that change, but this is the best lever that I've found. The success of that app and the fact that they were transparent and it worked out this way um, it has really emboldened them to think more about open source as a, as a change agency vector within Ireland to increase their, um, their technology output and, and the culture of technology in Ireland generally. So and, and can I can I because I know Denise you've been involved because I think you're right that's an absolutely brilliant example of how trust can be built uh, or can be helped in the context of of kind of citizen services where where people just want to know that thing that things are being done right and having yeah. that access is amazing but you've also been involved with um some other kind of uh, city projects as well i know i know you've been involved in talking with the city of paris around lutes which has been used in baltimore in terms of trying to yeah. bring across city services so um maybe you can just give us a little tiny introduction to what lutes is so that because if it comes up later we kind yeah, of get sure. a gist of exactly what's been happening there Absolutely. So I am privileged to have been working with the city of Paris now, thanks to Jacob, for almost a year and a half now. And um, they wrote a soup to nuts city services engine, which they call Lutes, which is the old name for Paris. And it was it was written to their specifications, but it has been it is open source. It has been open source since it was written because there's a law in France that says publicly funded software development must be open source, which I think is a brilliant law. So that code has been available for a really long time and um, the city of Lyon uses it. There's a little bit of use in Toulouse, but now we are looking at pulling that into the, the set of tools that are useful for Baltimore as it reinvents itself. And um, I, I'm sure when the St. Francis people talk, they're gonna have a lot to say about Lutes and I imagine that Jacob will as well. Um, and then, of course, it, a lot of that expertise is being built at Johns Hopkins. So almost everybody in this panel is somehow involved with Lutes. Um, and it's a, it's a fabulous project. And I think it's something that maybe we, we should explore a little bit more when we get to more of the open questions, just in terms of, you know, when we think about communities being involved in the creation of software and how that can engender trust, we also need to think about if something is developed somewhere else, how do we make it local? How do we get those communities involved if it has to be after the fact, you know? But, but, but open source gives people the opportunity to do that. So without further ado, though, I'd like to bring in Torben, who's joined us. It look, looked like you were driving here, getting in on, on, on the panel. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Torben, um, maybe you could just uh, give a little bit of an overview of, of St. Francis's work and your work in terms of actually making St. Francis um, a, a kind of a smart center um, in, terms of, in terms of the neighborhood center. Um, and the importance of technology in that group. And I know you've been to Paris and been involved in some mm -hmm. of the discussions around, around your tests. So maybe uh, give us a, a view of, of your experiences so far and what you see the potential. Yeah, um, so if you're not familiar with St. Francis, um, we've been around since 1963. We're sort of one of the oldest community centers in Baltimore City. Uh, we've been working with our kids uh, for, with an after school program for about 10 years now. And uh, with those after school programmings, we've been bringing in like code into schools and we really like to bring in a lot of the uh, work that we do with coding and stuff like that uh, for our youth. Mm -hmm. um, but we also do other things with St. Francis. You know, we have grocery giveaways. We make sure we educate our parents also. Uh, it's not just about the kids, it's about the whole family unit and we're integrated in the community. And you know, we have a resource fair that we actually have one coming out August 1st that we bring in resources and, and uh, backpacks filled with like school supplies and stuff like that. This year would be a little different, but um, you know, we really 
survey the neighborhood to, to see what they want. And then we try to provide that for them. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, um, you know, we'd like to be first on a lot of things that we do, or at least be ahead of the pack. And uh, when COVID hit, we were pretty much like within 10 days, all of our students had laptops at their homes and had access to Wi-Fi. Um, so we had each of our teacher, we were assigned, we make sure we assigned them to the families to make sure they were okay, see if there's any issues with the internet, anything like that. And uh, Jane would trouble help troubleshoot and make sure, you know, they were getting on. So a month later, it looked like Baltimore City Public Schools finally tried to catch up and they started, you know, giving out some Chromebooks, but we were way ahead of the, pretty much everybody. Some places just shut down because they just really didn't know what to do. Um, we looked ahead and just made sure, you know, that they had what they needed. Um, and we've been running our after school program till, till, you know, till it ended. And then we started our summer program virtually with a hybrid of some online. And then of course, uh, some field trips on the side. And we're being very careful, careful about that too. So everyone's being getting their temperature taken. Everyone has to wear their mask. Um, I bought a, a fumigator, so the bus is cleaned out every night. Um, and of course, the first level of St. Francis is always um, is, is being fumigated as well. Um, but we really just the whole wraparound issue of some of the parents not knowing, yeah. you know, some of the newer technology. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we're really trying to help them out with that. And Jane has a big part in that. Um, but um, was there another question that, that I well, might have missed? No, I think, I mean, you're, you're kind of broaching on the conversation that we had earlier. I mean, when we think about community getting involved, like open source, Denise was sharing how open source started because technologists wanted to have more trust in technology um, mm -hmm. because they wanted to kind of, you know, rather than trusting the corporations. But I think what we're hearing here is that this is this conversation is moving on now. We need to have citizens, people who are not technologists have trust in technology, not just technologists. And so like really an open question here is how do we make that happen? H how do we create a way of engaging of com communities in a way and languages and ways of communicating between people who don't have technology backgrounds and people who are creating city services or, or adapting city services? And, you know, maybe yourself or maybe even Jane, I know, Jane, you're also involved in this kind of human centered design idea. Um, you know, how have you tackled that? Because you guys are working with um, with the folks that are bringing Lutece to Baltimore. So how are you do you what, what are your ideas about how to make that happen to create that communication? Yeah, um, so I mean, I'm so lucky to have been involved in this program. Um, this is like so much beyond what I expected when I joined St. Francis Center. Um, so basically what we have been doing, St. Francis Center has been a staple of Reservoir Hill for a long time. Like everybody in the neighborhood knows us. Um, so that's made it really easy for us to kind of act as an anchor for Moss Labs and JHU in making sure that we get the community involved with this project. Um, and as you said, I attended Micah's social design program and something that we like to talk about is how everyone has the capacity to be a designer, um, just not everyone has the tools to do so. Um, so it's been really important with this project that we are engaging community members, not just in like research and surveys and asking questions, but actually engaging our kids and families in the design process of Lutis. Um, and so that's kind of what I've been trying to implement. It's of course gotten harder with COVID um, because we used to be able to, we conducted research at these stoop night gatherings that we have, which are basically kind of like a fun neighborhood gathering. Um, Torben is... <laughs> Turban has been to many a stoop night. Um, but yeah, so we started by basically trying to engage our community members from the very like beginning of the design process, not saying we want to create this thing, but talking to them about their needs and talking to them more holistically about our services and our programs um, and what we can do and then using that research in the development of the Lutis program. 
and okay. and I think I think it's important to kind of I kind of recognize here that like organizations like St. Francis are helping kind of create these connections in between this translation points in between communities and organizations that may have technologists in them or or have the technology so i mean congratulations you guys because because you're not just consumers you're, you're you're creating real value in terms of um creating these connections and same with hack baltimore right like you guys are on the ground helping engage people in, in creating the technology that's going to impact their lives. And, and that's, that's so much more than you hear of from many programs, which is just about kind of getting them up and running with the stuff they are, that's already out there. So yeah, I, just, so congratulations. But, but, I, but I'll keep moving on through the panel just so we can hear from everyone first, but then we'll, we'll, we'll move in to explore that theme a little bit more. I think it's so important. So Saeed, you've been involved from John Hopkins from many angles in Johns Hopkins, um, but I know you specifically have been involved in the setup of what may be the first open source program office in, 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 in a university you know, that, uh, that, that's doing this kind of cross, focusing on this collaboration um, cross borders and things like that. Can, can you maybe elaborate on to, to what you've been doing there and, and, and how important that is in this process? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Uh, and I'll, I'll begin by saying I'm talking about Hopkins and its relationship with the city of Baltimore, but I think this is largely true of universities and their relationships with the cities in which they, they live. Uh, I've actually been an undergraduate, a graduate student at Hopkins. I now work there as an administrator and a researcher, and I live in the neighborhood. I live in Charles Wood. So I have lots of relationships with Hopkins. Uh, and what I, I think is fair to say, if you're in Baltimore, this is probably not a shock to you, is the relationship Hopkins has with the city is complicated. Um, and I will also say that Johns Hopkins is a large institution with lots of different clusters of people, all of whom have very different opinions. So I don't mean to speak you know, in gross generalizations. But I do think it's fair to say that more often than not, the way Hopkins tends to approach working with people in the city is we are Hopkins, we have a tremendous deal of expertise and capacity and talent. And we're here to help raise your expertise, capacity and talent. Um, and I, I, it is well-meaning, but it's terribly misguided. <laughs> um, and I think what, what an OSPO or an open source programs office does and what open source one of the really appealing aspects to me about open source we've heard this from the previous panelists is it's really not about technology it's about a way of working together mm -hmm. and what what the ospo has done at at the university has given us a new way of working with people in the city uh, there are established mechanisms for doing that and i'm not saying those shouldn't exist and, and many of them make a lot of sense uh, i'll give you one very small but important example that hopkins is thinking about having kind of produce masks uh, for for you know its affiliates and there's a local group in baltimore that we are going to hire out to do that so th there are lots of other ways to do this but I, I i think what this allows us to do is on this technology front on the front of how can we use technology to address some of the challenges that Baltimore faces, working with the people of Baltimore? Open source is a new pathway to do that. And it's very important to, to point out that this office is in the libraries in Hopkins because the libraries touch upon every one of the divisions in the university. We touch upon all of the research areas, all the educational areas, uh, and then we are considered a neutral entity. And to the extent that Hopkins has direct connections with community members, the library is probably one of the, the strongest points where that happens. Uh, so it, it's a neutral, trusted partner within the institution. We're hoping that that can be extended in, you know, outside of the walls of the institution as well. And if, if I could put Jane on the spot, uh, I read a blog post from her a long time ago where she made a really important point that too many times the interactions tend to be for a weekend or for a class uh, or for a project. And then the students kind of go away. And one of the other things I like about open source is it's, it's not just possible, it's actually important that you track the sustained commitments, right? You can look at things like GitHub requests, you can look at pull requests, you can look at issues, and you can look at that over time. So we're now getting a transparent way to verify that there is in fact sustained engagement. And the last thing I'll say is uh, when I was a student, I worked with a group in Baltimore uh, called the People's Homesteading Group, uh, which had a model where families would be uh, given a home 
if they worked on it for 12 weeks. And I managed to convince a group of civil engineers, that was my undergraduate program, uh, to go volunteer for this, this group. And after our first stint for 12 weeks uh, working with this family, uh, the, the father came out with a bunch of cookies and uh, he said, my wife made these cookies for you because we're really grateful you, you worked with us on this. I didn't know there were kids like you at Johns Hopkins. Mm. And that, that has stayed with me, obviously, uh, for the rest of my life. I, I'd like to think that the Open Source Programs Office is a way for the folks in the city of Baltimore to recognize there are kids like that at Johns Hopkins and there are others like that. But more importantly, for the folks at Johns Hopkins to realize that there are a lot of very creative, talented, energetic, uh, empowered, passionate people in Baltimore with whom we can work. I think Lutess is just one example of that. Uh, I'm looking forward to many others. And, and of course, the, the conversation we have today. I, I think that's an incredibly important point when, when you talk about um, pathways and, and new pathways. Uh, for me, I'm a, I'm a relative newcomer to open source. I've kind of had my road to Damascus moment a, a couple of years ago. And, 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 you know, I'm not a coder per se, but what, what really strikes me about, about open source is that it does provide these new pathways for people to engage with technology. I, I mean, even with the Irish COVID tracking app, um, I was tracking that on GitHub and I was, I was really pleased to see that one of the first contributions back was some person who has decided that, you know, you, there's, there's a town in the west of Ireland called Cahir Sivine. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a relatively small town. And they were like, that's not how the locals spell it here. You know, we spell it this way. And I thought, you know, isn't that marvelous? Isn't it marvelous that, that open source gives people a way Way to prioritize their local issues, but it also gives a pathway for people who don't come through traditional pathways. So you don't have to have a computer science degree to get involved in open source. And that, that is, that's going to, that's going to open up so many opportunities, I think, for people that maybe they don't see today. Um, before we, and before we go into that a little bit more, I just want to go to Jacob, who hasn't had a chance to say hello yet, but Jacob, I mean, you, you've been in part of that whole process with bringing open source to Baltimore for a number of years now and working on the global scene around this as well in terms of how open source can impact cities. Can you, can you maybe talk about the global opportunity that you see here and, and, and the work that you've been doing across borders? Um, sure. Um, thanks much, Claire. Uh, first, let me thank again uh, our, our hosts at University of Baltimore and the, 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 what they produced with, with um, the vital signs report on the health of, of neighborhoods. I think it's really important that we have data about what's going on. I wanted to relay a, um, a story that we were talking to some people at the European Commission uh, three, four months ago now, and I was talking to them about how you know, we're from Bal I was from Baltimore, and we're trying to uh, connect across the Atlantic to engage. And the person said to me, I know Baltimore. The thing I know about Baltimore is that you all have a tremendous amount of passion for what we're doing in our city. And it, it was an enlightening moment that folks that were involved in the European Commission knew that Baltimore and the people of Baltimore were so passionate and so uh, involved in trying to, 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 to correct things. And that really jives with my experience here in Baltimore but for the last 15 years living in West Baltimore, uh, being an alumni from Hopkins, et cetera. It's been that, 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 that those, those experiences as, as a neighbor and building community and being involved and not deriving it, but be, being part of a, a larger group um, and all of the energy that's going on here in Baltimore and seeing how we can harness that and plug that in to there are conversations and there are, there are people that are working around this all over the globe. And I think part of our challenge is how do, how do we um, collaborate locally? How do we take that collaboration that's local and plug it into the collaboration that's going on globally? And then how do we together, uh, all of us, make sure that, that what we're producing from that, lo that local and global collaborations really has an impact um, locally. That's that cycle that uh, I think I saw that was really important. And so one of the things we've been trying to do is to, to harness the, the communities 
that exist both globally and locally to say, look, you spoke, we, we both speak the same language of community. Mm -hmm. How do we then work together through an institutional framework? Because, you know, we, we, it's very easy to work to get together five or six people and work together. When we start talking about 20 million developers globally and getting in more, more and more people into the we have to have a structure. We have to have institutions that we plug into and ways to, 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 to structure that. And so it's been really uh, enlightening and, 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 and um, an op a great opportunity to really start to connect the institutions of St. Francis, the institutions of Baltimore and University of Baltimore and MICA and Hopkins and, and Hack Baltimore to a global community that we have of what's going on in Paris, what's going on in Ireland, what's going on in Raleigh and Portland. And you know, we see in the national news that cities are where, where we're gonna find uh, the solutions to, uh, to, to, to a lot of our challenges. I think that at the end of the day, it's about how we collaborate and bring those cities together. And I'll stop there. I know I talk a lot as well. No, no, thank you, Jacob. Thank you. <laughs> and well, and we're and we're about halfway through. And I, I do want to let the um attendees, the audience know that if you want to uh, put any questions you have for the panelists in the Zoom chat functionality, we'll, we, we can take them from, from now if we, if we see them popping up. Though I see a lot of people are sharing some of the great resources you guys have mentioned, so I think that's amazing, so please continue to do that. Um, but if I can summarize the discussion so far, I, I think, you know, there's been three really amazing themes that have come out here. I suppose the first is that there is there's something about open source and the transparency around it that has a power to to build trust in both with both the people who are technically building the software but now i think it's moving to a point of it has to start moving into the people who are using the software the citizens right. that are, that are going to benefit from it so but but it has that power that transparency is important and 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 it really helps build trust but the second thing is this idea of of of, of citizens being empowered, like communities being empowered. That this is, this is not, technology is not for technologists. It's for everyone. It just happens to be built technically by technologists, but, but in conjunction, it should be built in conjunction with communities. So this idea of the community empowerment, and I, I think Denise put that in, in, the, in the thread there, but you know, everyone who's creative or energetic or idealistic, if you have the will to work on this, you should have a pathway to do it because because you don't have to be you don't have to have a computer science degree to get involved and and i think that that's what we need to make happen right and then the third thing is that there are opportunities on a worldwide basis to connect these efforts and we can't we can't not address that either because if everyone does it in their own backyard but doesn't look beyond that then we're also missing a trick because the whole thing about open source is building on the sh shoulders of giants so how do we create the institutional scaffolding or, or, or connections that make that work. So maybe we can take those three themes and maybe explore some of those now in the next half hour. But um, I'd love, maybe Torben, you, you were talking about the idea of working with the families in St. Francis in terms of understanding their need. Like you are providing that translation function. Do you maybe want to talk about how you can see that evolving to, to have more impact with technology? Yeah, absolutely. Um... Communication, uh, right off the bat, knowing the needs of the families. Uh, I mean, you multiply that by, let's say we have 30, 40 families, you know, that's a lot of people getting information and information from, and uh, you could use that information and with open source, and it's a, just a good way to make sure people are understanding where, where that data is going and what is what it's doing and I think uh, with that happening it, it it it's motivation for them to really want to understand the technology uh, and and be able to teach it and I think that's just a way a, a way to do that and and you've been working with Denise and you've been hanging out with Denise and Jacob mm -hmm. and going to open source events I mean can you maybe comment on or maybe and Denise too comment on like your learnings about how to make that communication happen from your world to the tech world like how's that gone and like how, how do we all get better at that well that's more of a Jane question uh, uh, than it is a <laughs> I hear you've been question. doing it too though <laughs> <laughs> you're just a natural talent <laughs> But uh, yeah, for the most part, 
uh, my communication with with the families and all this just it's just to get get that information to them and and to get some information back from them and then that's where Jane takes over for the most part so <laughs> okay Jane take it from here what, what do you think about the communication points what how do we make how do we get better at creating those and and speaking a language where everyone gets to have their say in a meaningful way yeah, so I mean, I think as I said, like involving people from the beginning of the design process and also just being really transparent about intentions. Um, because I think like for us who are more familiar with open source, it's easy to see how this is such an amazing thing that's like gonna, um, like Denise said, create space for creative people, you know, who are very driven. But if you don't know what open source is, um, and a lot of the time that starts with just having access to the technology in the first place, um, to kind of like learn about these things, then it doesn't really matter to you. So I think being really transparent about your intentions and about how this is actually going to come back and benefit the community for people to be involved in the process. That's the most important thing. Um, I went back when I was like a little design student at MICA, I talked to Elder Harris um, from Jubilee Arts and Intersection of Change, which is in Sandtown. Um, and he said, I was trying to do a design project about um, litter and Department of Public Works and equity. And he said, basically like, well, how is this gonna help me? Cause people come into my community all the time and ask me to participate in things. And it takes my time up and it takes up my mental resources to talk about this. Um, but if it's just coming from, you know, Johns Hopkins or MICA or university, and this is where that <laughs> blog post came from Saeed about students who come in do their research and basically use Baltimore's communities as like a petri dish um, and then just up and leave and nothing comes of it, then you're not fostering that trust. Um, so I think that that's where St. Francis being such a longstanding like icon of the community is helpful because people do trust us. But even um, within St. Francis, it's important to constantly be checking ourselves on our transparency and our on our communication. Um, and, you know, limiting the kind of like jargon that people use when they talk about technology, making sure to explain everything because everyone has the capacity to understand and be involved in this. It's just a matter of access um, and making sure that it's done in an equitable way. Okay, and, and so I'm just looking here about the about the questions coming through and, and Seema makes the point that there's, there's, and you make the point about how, how do we limit the jargon, how do we get people aware of this. Denise, I mean, you've, you've been involved in, in this kind of open source efforts for a very long time, and I know, I know it's a continuous effort within the technology community. So, I mean, what, what, are, what are your ideas about how to help build the sustainability of these communities that are involved in open source, but helping kind of scale the efforts around teaching what it means, what the intentions are, how to build these ideas of sustainable communities. I mean, how do we do that? You're on mute again. <laughs> Lisa told me this time. Uh, yeah, so I have been an, a full-time advocate for open source for 20 years, and I've been involved in a fair amount of change agency at lots of different levels. And I started worrying about five years ago about the sustainability of the movement because there were a lot more people using open source than there were contributing to open source. And it's like any resource, you have to keep reseeding the grass. You can't just eat the grass, you have to keep reseeding it. If you don't do that, it's gonna die as a resource. So I got interested in the problem of people who don't understand how to work this way or don't have, are so ingrained in the other competitive way of working that they, they don't, know what to do and they make the wrong choices and they kill their communities. So I started something called intersourcecommons.org, which is an organization dedicated to teaching people how to use open source methods inside their organizations before they try to go public with their, with their attempts. And what it does is it helps people understand the value and also the pattern of collaboration so that when they join open source communities, they aren't working at cross purposes with the rest of the community and having a lot of pushback. And not everybody needs that. Some people can just dive in. And to the question of, do you need to be a technologist? You know, my degree's in French literature, but I was the CTO of Wikipedia. Open source opens your options so much wider than you could possibly imagine. You could really do anything just by showing up and being consistent and working hard towards the right goal. 
Um, a lot of open source people like to think about leaving the campground better than we found it. That's what we're here for, not just in our work in open source, but in our lives. We're those kind of people. We want to help. We want to make things better. And so for people who, who are also wired that way, it can be possible to just dive in. But there are an awful lot of people who are worried that they're going to get it wrong, and especially organizations worry that they're going to get it wrong and it's going to be the only chance they have. So that's why we came up with InnerSourceCommons.org, and it's a really good place to go if you're trying to understand all these patterns. There's lots of resources there. And I know Saeed has been spending some time there. Jacob's been very involved in the growth of that organization. And, um, you know, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. It's just there for people to use. So it's, it's worth checking out. So that's fantastic. And so, so, you know, as an effort from an organizational perspective, that sounds great. But, and then if we think about the idea of folks that aren't in corporations that might engage that way, Dion, you were, you were talking about, you know, the, the empowerment of folks on the ground. And I know Denise has talked a lot about um, enlightened self-interest and, you know, I, I love the, the kind of differentiation between a competitive approach to building software. And like, I mean, really, does do citizen services, is there a space for competitive approaches when it comes to citizen services? Probably not, but maybe you can talk about this idea of how, how, how do you think that we, apart from just the developers you work with, Dion, how do we get more community involvement in that process? Or is that something that you've cracked at Hack Baltimore or maybe can talk about how we could scale that? Um, so that's what's most exciting about Hack Baltimore because the panel we've discussed, you know, building these sustainable communities, but before you can get to the communities, you need sustainable solutions. Mm -hmm. Before you can get to the solutions, you need to be able to unpack the challenge, unpack the problems. Um, what I have noticed is that when we say community, and it, I was actually brought to my attention um, based off of an interaction in community, um, technologists come in with this feel that they're going to save is a savior. I'm going to come in and uh, take over and I'm going to do better, you know, for you. Um, and that the community is everybody else. Um, and it was brought to my attention Dion, to look at it. We're all technology. You're all a part of the same community. You're impacted by the same challenges that we are. Now, what Hack Baltimore has done is actually we're building a model. We are creating a model, a system that really helps you think differently about problems. So design thinking, we've actually created a template, a model that we're perfecting now. Like right now, uh, Dent Education, I'll use them as an example, with COVID-19. Um, Rajan, Mickey, the whole team there, they heard from their students that their students felt as if they weren't engaged. They felt isolated. They wanted to be of service to folks, but they were quarantined, right? Qu quarantined, we were all locked down. And in recognizing that challenge, they brought everyone, for Pat Baltimore, we brought everyone together, right? And let's go through discovery. Let's really hash this thing out. Based off of design thinking, based off of unpacking and challenging assumptions and making sure that you have right people around the table, they actually created a workforce development program for their students to be able to provide PPE equipment for frontline staff and create an income. That is a new way of approaching a challenge. Um, but where's the meeting space for this to happen? Where does the template begin? And Hack Baltimore has really raised a hand. You do not have to be a technologist. So that the, when we say civic hacker, and I think we spoke about this yesterday about even the term civic. Mm -hmm. um, I had to find a different way to brand this because when you say Hack Baltimore, it has so many different you know, you get know, so many indications. Yeah. Like, are you trying to get a ride? Are you trying to break something? What exactly are you trying to do? Um, but when you take a step back and realize what a civic hacker is, and someone asked a question in a panel, we need to start teaching civics to our children to really understand that you have a place in the changes that you see. You do not have to be a techie in order to recognize a problem in your community and use whatever it is that you have. I love the word will. I usually say your grit, bronze, talent, whatever it is that God gave you, bring that to the table and those people figure it out. So Hack Baltimore has said to ourselves, look, if we can build a model, 
if we can, since, what is uh, Delali? I'm gonna quote him. Um, Civic hacking isn't a skill set, it's a mindset, right? It's a mindset. How do you change a mindset? Hack Baltimore is doing that and creating a model so that we can then to, to the point about going global. We are not the only people experiencing the challenges that we are, but I often say Baltimore, everyone, we are the name on everyone's tongue. Everyone's got something to say about Baltimore. With that being the case, that means that any problem or challenge we solve in Baltimore, we can solve it for the world. So we wanna create those models so that we can go ahead and share that with the world. That's social innovation. Um, and that's what we're, we're creating now. Well, I think that's amazing. I, 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 was, I was reading, um, I think it was yesterday or something, someone was putting up that maybe, maybe what you're creating is not a mindset. It shouldn't be mindset, it should be mind flex. We should not be setting our minds, but we should be flexing our minds to create these new systems. And I really like the idea of your kind of new system for innovation. So, you know, um, and I think, I, think, I think what we're talking about here then is, is, is this idea of creating these new ways, patterns, pathways, um, systems to engage a broader set of people than just technologists in this whole right. ecosystem and this whole in the bigger system right, um, right. but then but then we need to find ways to to learn what works and then spread it globally because if this is it yeah because this like the, the potential to do innovation quickly with these kind of new processes seems to be extraordinary um, and then maybe Saeed like you know you've been working on this institution to institution way of sharing so like is your work in johns hopkins and the work that you're doing in terms of collaborating cross borders like you know can that provide a mechanism to take things like what hack baltimore are doing and share that with the world like is, is that what we're talking about in terms of your intention yeah i mean i think hopkins in many ways is an engine or an amplifier if you want to think about it that way um mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. just just maybe i can give you one specific example um and this builds on a lot of the things previous panelists have said. And I was very fortunate to have an advisor who told me once that engineering is a liberal art. And I was completely perplexed by what he meant. Um, but what he basically said was, it's about people, processes, and products, and the workflows that connect them. And what many engineers tend to do is go right to the product. Uh, and, and I think in the software development world, those of you who know that world, it, it's about requirements, right? You basically go out and gather a set of requirements and then you build the software to those requirements. I think you, th that's a mechanical process. Uh, you, you can meet the requirements and be done. If you think about a design process, and obviously Jane's talked about that a great deal, but also one of the people that Jacob introduced me to uh, was Sherry Parks at MICA, who really talks about this a great deal, right? So you're going to have to meet my cat during any Zoom call, I'm sorry. Um, it, it, the design process, I think, is what ultimately gets to those people, processes, and products and the workflow, particularly the people side. And I think if you can take a design approach to it, you don't get a mechanical system, you get an inspirational system, right, or a response. And the, I think about this in the case of uh, homeless shelters. So this Latest platform has a plugin that basically would help identify what, what homeless shelters have beds available. Mm -hmm. I know that a typical engineering class basically we would say, oh, here's a requirement. You need to know how many beds there are, or where they are, what night, and go get it. Well, a group of Hopkins students actually did some research and said it's not that simple. You have to know what homeless shelters have low beds because people have to plug in ventilators and things like that. You have to know which ones only allow women. You have to know things like that. That's where you start to get into the people side and the processes side. And I think if we really want to do this well, you engage the community directly so that that's a tool you use with a sense of dignity and a sense of agency, not that here I am to help you poor homeless person, but rather, what is it you need? You know, when, when you're making this choice, what do you feel, right? I mean, is that a crazy question to ask for a software development project? I, I think we can go from the mechanical to the inspirational to, to the really engaged with people saying, I will use this because you asked me what kind of experience I'm going to have using it rather than, Look, I've solved your problem. Go use it. And now let's put it on GitHub and everyone will use it. Well, we, we would love to all be inspirational and to end up creating inspirational uh, civic services. So I think that's amazing. Um, Jacob, we're, we're, we're kind of coming close to the end. Do you, do you want to maybe again comment on 
all of what has been said so far, but then, as I said, the potential to, to kind of scale this. Because, like, here's the thing, right? I'm hearing about what's happening in Baltimore. I'm, I'm looking at what happened in Ireland with the COVID app. I'm kind of thinking, like, we should be taking what you guys have and bringing it over here, right? Because um, <laughs> I'm loving this. We're, Dion, we're going to talk afterwards. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think the, 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 the ideas that have been shared here are so important to to get to a broad audience. So Jacob, can you maybe talk about maybe your plans to help do that or, or what we can all do to help a process whereby we are all building inspirational, trustworthy, valuable, community-driven mm -hmm. services? I think the panel here today has, 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 has um, hit on so many of the right uh, themes in terms of community and human-centered design and how we can in engage in those fronts. I wanted to bring it back to the idea that there are 32,000 municipalities in the U.S. alone. 32,000 municipalities in the U.S., Baltimore is one of them. But we're unique in the fact that um, I think we have a, a greenfield opportunity here in Baltimore mm. to say what we build here can be, we, we want to think within a mindset, we want to sh uh, share it and to design it to be scaled to those right. three. 32,000 other municipalities, but we also have to go in with a mindset of what has everyone else built in those other 32,000 municipalities? How can we work in their communities to, to try it here in Baltimore? Because it, it doesn't work if we, if we build something here and, and export it. We have, it just has to be a community where we're also taking what others are doing. And so that was why it's really important to say the city of Paris has done this. The city of Paris is known as an international uh, city of collaboration globally, worldwide. Can we not leverage that brand and that, that, um, that opportunity for global collaboration to get together and say, hey, Paris, you built something. We're going to try it here in Baltimore. We're going to try to adapt it here in Baltimore to our needs and share back those contributions. Can you, when we build things here in Baltimore, can you try them in the city of Paris? Can you work with us to get those brought up? That's that type of, uh, that, that type of we, we want to build things here locally. We want to try things out here and lo adapt them locally. With the mindset, we're part of a global community, th that we need to build that institution to institution structure because that's what's going to get us that scale. If we don't really focus on the mechanics of that and the sustainability of that, you know, that's, that, that's where, and the, I think that's where the promise is. So I'd like to leave it with the idea of, I think we have an opportunity to make Baltimore a, 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 a home for global open source as it relates to cities. Not the only home, but a key uh, city in, 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 in solving these challenges. And I would love to, you know, to, to look back four or five years from now and say, you know what, we, we were building a network. We were building a network of, between cities and, and Baltimore and, and some other cities were, were, were some of the first key um, members of the community of that network. And this is where a lot of that, that, that network started. And so again, I'll put the theme out. Baltimore is the next home for uh, global innovation through open source and through open source collaboration. All right. Thank you so much. So, uh, well, we're coming up to the the time at the end of the hour. Um, I know that uh, Seema is very keen to have me uh, remind everyone that there's a survey that we would like you to fill out the form to evaluate the session. Um, and I hope, Seema, maybe you'll share that link in the actual um, public chat there so everyone would see it. Um, and uh, I just want to kind of finish up by saying thank you all so much for sharing your point of views. I think what's happening in Baltimore, what you guys are doing sounds absolutely amazing. I look forward to following up to see maybe what we can take to Ireland. But um, I would I'd just like to say thank you to all thank of you. you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dion, thank you, Denise, thank you, Torben, thank you, Jane, thank you, Saeed, thank you, Jacob. Um, it's been a marvelous discussion, and uh, I really thank you all for listening and for participating in the chat as well. So, thanks everyone, and I hope that the rest of Baltimore Data Week goes great. And looking forward to seeing you next time. Bye. <laughs>